and everyone can edit it so just feel free to edit or like you know in case you feel like suggesting anything yeah i think excalibur is the one that i i think i was talking about right so excalibur is pretty good but just that i heard that google doesn't allow these things they only prefer google docs so that's oh. why i was just trying my hand oh, right. with google docs all right so i think we can probably um start um okay so let's shall we start now yeah okay yeah so um so the question for today is uh design a task scheduler system uh, sorry which one uh, a task uh, or a okay, job task. yeah okay. right, scheduler system right? and uh, when we say like you know we are designing this task scheduler system what kind of task is it like is it for something specific or we need to create something generic so that different kind of tasks can be scheduled yeah so this is uh, uh, yeah i think the the design can can be um, should be a little bit more inclusive right like you can kind of um, execute any kind of task okay fine uh, but, and then but we can even take that as an external requirement for now let's say it's a simple uh, script that we download and execute for the first version it's okay cool can we share the screen so that it is being recorded so it is the screen is also recorded okay sure i'll do that uh, my screen is visible now yeah yeah thank you no problem uh then who are the producers of the data when we say that uh, we want to download this particular script and run it on a lot of systems right Mm -hmm. so who will be producing these scripts like are these automated or these scripts are coming from somewhere is it kind of a patch that we want to download like what what the script is like like i think again it's it's part of how you want to design it right like so uh, i'm just leaving it very broad as to okay. uh, it's uh, i i'll tell you the yeah so okay so from my side i'll tell you the requirement the requirement should be right um uh, like there are different clients you know like who should have some kind of a way to run their tasks right and for now these tasks are just scripts right so uh, we just like generically we can simply put them as simply clients right like so mm -hmm. uh, like how you design it would be the way that they would finally end up using it cool so that choice is yours yeah fine and uh, when we want to schedule them like uh, is it based on the time or some other parameter that you want to schedule the tasks right so it's going to be um uh, uh, uh based on time mm -hmm. and this could be uh, um either a one off or a recurring right and when the task is completed like do we first of all like do we want to prioritize the task that you know these are kind of high priority tasks or is it kind of we need not care like once we have no, the time we no. have to so, figure yeah, exactly yeah here the priority is basically the time right like so we already have a scheduling system for that yeah so we don't have to worry about like within the same time we don't have to worry about the priority fine and in uh, what is the sla like in case we breach the sla what happens in that case Um, suppose you say that run this particular task at 5 pm but then i run it at 5 pm one second so is that yes. acceptable or that is kind of yeah the granularity can be considered as a uh, uh, a minute and not less than a minute sure so the plan lady right like so it's uh, um um even let's say you say i mean i think when submitting itself it's uh, either you submit it to the minimal granularity or it will be rounded down to the next minute granularity right so sure that yeah. makes sense uh then and you you still have a little bit of leeway let's say for example uh, if the user submits uh, saying hey run this at uh, at at 5:30 pm right like so uh, uh which means that um uh, so when i meant the granularity is a minute uh, mm -hmm. what i meant was like you wouldn't have to run something like one at 5:30 Uh, pm and 5 seconds and then there would be another task that would run at 5:30 pm and 10 seconds kind of a thing right like so right. like you like jobs will be need to be run at 5:30 pm the next time jobs need to be run at would be 5:31 pm 
correct 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 just that like you know since it is 5:30 we suppose we put it in a queue and then it gets pulled by the worker so the maximum limit we have of the time is between 5:30 and 5:31 right yes then you are well within the sla if you can uh, yes. if you do that if you if you cross that yeah this is a best effort kind of a system so our goal is to design it in such a way that like we try to honor as much as possible in some cases we may not be we will violate this right so the core of the problem i see from the functional requirements is that we need to provide a functionality to the users a ui kind of a thing wherein they can put in their tasks saying this is the particular task and this is the time i want this to be triggered and then inside the system uh, we need to design an algorithm wherein it keeps picking up the jobs and starts scheduling them right so these are the two main core problems i see from the system design does that sound fair enough yes more than a ui it will be even better if it is a simple rest api based uh, yeah. or a grp based system because then uh, you can programmatically call right your services Fine. can your clients can actually call cool and then moving towards the non functional requirements how much is the daily active user count we are anticipating for the system yeah so for this kind of a system uh, both including recurring tasks and on off tasks that needs to be run you can assume mm -hmm. that on an average you will be seeing around uh, 100 million uh, jobs per day and when we have these jobs like what all are the parameters the parameters i can think of is basically the job id then who is the owner of this particular job and at what time this needs to run and what all machines it needs to run correct all that information will be provided by the end user so so uh, i am assuming that it is out of scope that we need to configure the cluster that where these tasks need to be executed right we need not worry about that as of now we are mainly concerned with scheduling the task and running them in time uh right right uh, so yeah so from a client perspective right like so if you think about it like i as a client does i don't have to worry about where this task right? right like so in your input when you mentioned the machines to run kind of a thing so i don't think the client should be worried about it the client should simply right. say hey you know i have this task and in the simplest case a script that needs to run it needs to run 5 pm every day or it needs to run every half an hour or it needs to run one time which is like you know like tomorrow at 8 am something like that right that's fine Uh, so we have the total number of tasks in a particular day, and then we want to provide durability in the sense that tomorrow a particular user can user can go and see in the history that these were the particular tasks which executed, or like you know these are the tasks and what is their status as of now. Yes. So that yeah, I think uh, um, I think both are good, but definitely the what the status of a particular job is. Yes, that is uh, for sure. Fine. uh and then uh, the freshness of this data like as the task is executed do we want to trigger a notification telling to the user hey your task has been executed or uh, we leave it up to the user that whenever he wants he can come to our system and see yeah i think for simplicity sake uh, let let's let's uh, derive this uh, let's put this on the user's board okay okay fine Cool. So I think the non-functional requirements I have captured is we need to provide strong durability, consistency, and availability. I will talk in terms of the APIs, like when we design them, for which API, what we want to go go ahead with, mm -hmm. correct? And then the freshness is basically we have already defined the SLA that it should be within a minute, and we are not taking care of notifying the user. Let the user, as of now, come to our system and see what is the status of a particular task. Exactly. fine uh, i think i am good with the functional and non functional requirements just one okay. thing like do we uh, care about the you know such scenarios wherein there is a burst of traffic uh, and by this i mean suppose the task can be anything right it can be dependent on a particular even suppose the task is to pump a particular video to the cdns right mm -hmm. so yeah. suppose so a particular video is pretty hot so do we need to care about those scenarios or as of now we want to develop a kind of some something simple yes i think yeah for now let's not assume anything about uh, about about you know what these tasks are doing right like so fine so now i'm moving ahead with the api design so uh, you are fine with the functional and non functional requirements mm, yes yeah cool. so the first api uh, i can think of is the submit task mm -hmm. 
and in this one i'll be having the auth token basically the user who is uh, submitting this task mm -hmm. the task uh, it will be then the payload of like all the information of the task correct it will be a json mm -hmm. it will be the task information uh, and then uh, we can ask like what is the uh, trigger time of this particular task moreover is it kind of a one-off or a task or a reoccurring in case it is a reoccurring so again we have uh, some parameters like is reoccurring a boolean mm -hmm. and in case it is a reoccurring then what is the interval right mm -hmm. so these are the few fields which i think are needed for a particular user to submit a particular task and once he provides us the uh, information we uh, assuming a very simplistic design we persist it in the database and give a status to the user that the task has been accepted correct or it is in progress yes. and another uh, api which i can think of is to view the state uh, view the status mm -hmm. moreover in this one along with this we even give the task id to the user using which he can see the status of that particular task so he will give again the auth token and the task id to see what is the status of that task and uh, uh, scheduling these tasks th this will be internal to the system so i'm not putting it up in the apis so talking about the consistency and availability as per the apis for the first api to submit the task uh, I feel we need to have uh, availability here because, uh, I mean, uh, we uh, the system needs to be always available to accept the tasks from the user. And consistency in this context means to me that when a particular submits a task, when he gets a confirmation that the task is accepted, in that case, if he immediately goes and says, give me the status of this particular task, at least he should get, uh, see, you know, that, okay, my task has been submitted and its status is in progress. Yes. Right. He shouldn't see that, you know, the task has, hasn't been accepted by the system because uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, we shouldn't be going back into the time. That sounds reasonable. So for this API, the system should be highly available and consistency is no going back in time. Uh, and then for view status, again, for view status, the system should be highly available. And for uh, viewing the status, like uh, when we have an SLA of one minute, I think within that one minute, it can be an eventual consistent system, correct? Um, sure, yeah. Right. Uh, like uh, the previous thing that uh, it, uh, the views shouldn't be going back in time, that still holds true. But then uh, when I say it, it should be eventual consistent, what I mean by that is, uh that uh, uh, even though the task has been executed but then updating it in the database it might take some time right some milliseconds so yep. that much eventual consistency should be fine that's true yeah uh then uh going ahead uh, do you still want to talk about the data modeling or we can directly jump to the estimates the uh, actual design and in case we have time we can uh, move towards the data modeling part i think yeah i think we can probably talk about the design that's a little bit more important for this question one thing that i kind of wanted to point out is like this eventual consistency to update the state right so this is something that's not visible to the clients right like so right uh, so in because, case there is a user because we say that you know the user has the freedom of any time coming back to our system right so suppose right. the user has scheduled a task at 5 30 and let's assume he comes to our system at you know 5 29 and he starts you know refreshing his page so i mean uh, by eventual consistency i mean that even though his task you know it's triggered on time at 5 30 but then the status can be updated say you know within few seconds okay right uh, then i'm moving towards the high level design uh, once we are done with the high level design then i'll take care of the estimates in between like you know to see how we want to scale our system mm -hmm. 
I have one question. Mm-hmm. Uh, why we are going with the view status with the eventual one? Shouldn't user or client may get confused like what happened to his job? Uh, no, even though the job has been accepted by the system, correct? With eventual consistency, what mm-hmm. I mean is even though the job has been executed, but then say uh, the status getting updated into the database, it may take five seconds, right? Because, uh, you know, the system is kind of distributed. The user might be sitting in, say, Asia region, but then his task is getting executed in several systems, which are there in Australia and uh, you can say US, right? So there will be network mm-hmm. latency involved in getting back the status that the task has been executed on how many machines, like whether it is a success and how much percentage of it is, is a success, right? So it's and not one, a regional one, service or anything? So one kind request. So I think because we are also timing this, right? So I would uh, probably reserve uh, questions from the audience to the end. Uh, questions or clarifications. So that, that, that's the that sound okay? That will also allow uh, MindPixel to finish its design. So we'll, we'll get to every question, but we'll probably have them at the end. Uh, so uh, going to the high level diagram, I have the client sitting, uh, he sends his request to the API gateway. So API gateway basically distinguishes between the request using the URI and then he, uh, the API gateway routes the request either to submit the task service or to view the status of that particular task. And both of them, like they, uh, they will be connected to, to a database. This will be the task DB. So just to give the flow, the client sends the request to the API gateway. API gateway forwards that request to the submit task service. And the submit task service persists that uh, task in the database, giving back the status to the client, saying the task has been accepted. Another flow can be that the client asks the API gateway to give the status of a particular task. And this service connects to the database. Now, along with that, we will be having uh, one more service, which will be, which is the core of this problem, which is the task scheduler. Mm-hmm. What this does is it basically pulls the tasks from the database and you know it sees that okay this is the particular task and this is the one I need to prioritize. So I will have the task scheduler here along with the task scheduler. Uh, we can decide later on but as of now I'll prefer keeping a queue here to make the system asynchronous. That it takes up a task from the database, it puts it up in the queue, and then there will be another service which keeps pulling the tasks from the queue and see that okay, is it a distributed task? What are regions I need to, uh, you know, run this task, and what is the time, right? Uh, so this is the overall design which I can think of. Uh, is this fine? So looking back into the functional requirements, we basically had uh, the requirements of scheduling, a, uh, submitting a task and then scheduling that task to make sure uh, that the system is able to pull those, those tasks and schedule them within a particular minute. So I think these are the two APIs which we have exposed. One is to submit the task and another is to view the status. And then behind the scene, like we have uh, this job call as the task manager, which keeps pulling the database to see what all jobs are there. And as and when it's required, it will push those tasks into the queue, which will be picked by the job scheduler. And then the task gets scheduled. Does this sound uh, fine? Right. Yeah. I think for the high level design, this is, this is okay. But I, but uh, the flow that you kind of mentioned, right? Like for what happens, um, um, what happens when, like when a user uh, where does it end when a user submits a task? Right. Mm-hmm. So, which is like, uh, let's say flow one, right? Like, so the user submits a task. Mm-hmm. And, um, um, so, where does that flow end? So, when the user submits a task, so uh, let me just do uh, a small uh, estimate and then I'll complete the flow. So, we said that, you know, the uh, 
total requests, the queries per day, which we are getting are around 100 million. So we see that the queries per second, which we'll be getting are around 1000 tasks, which are submitted by the particular users, correct? So I think these are not that much high that we need uh, a queue or something in between to persist them into the database. So that is why I feel when a particular client submits a task, it goes to the submit task service and uh, we can uh, scale the, the service horizontally to receive the user's request. And it basically inserts that data, that record into the database with the status as task accepted. And that is when it gives an acknowledgement back to the client because we want to provide high durability here, right? Had been the case that we had a very high QPS, say around 50K in that case, what I would have done is I would have introduced a queue in between the submit task service and the task DB, wherein another worker would be pulling up the tasks from the queue and then ingesting them into the database. And when the service had submitted the task to the queue, that is when we would have given an acknowledgement to the client that your task has been accepted. But as of now, I see that the QPS is not that much high, so I'll keep it simple. And I'll, uh, you know, le uh, let the submit task service keep ingesting the data into the database. Okay. Fine. So the other flow would be, uh, I think the main flow, right? Like, so how does, yes, the, the, given the tasks are there in the DB, how does they get executed on time? Right. So now how does the task get executed on time. So first, the one thing I would like to discuss is uh, how the task manager works. Like how will it prioritize? Like uh, will it, uh, will it will we be having multiple instances of task manager based on different users or uh, based on different time slots, correct? Uh, another thing I would like to discuss here is how will the uh, how will it put it into the queue? Once it pulls the tasks that, okay, these are the tasks which I need to schedule, how will it pu uh, put it into the queue and how will it distribute it in uh, globally those tasks? Uh, as of now, I think these are the two main uh, discussion points I have, then if we have time, we can talk about how do we make sure that the system is fault tolerant. And we can also talk about uh, like, uh, before that, I'll also like to cover the database sharding in case it is required. So are these four points for deep dive fine? Sure. Yeah. I think, yeah, the first two are probably um, yeah. the most important, right? Yeah, most important, yeah. To complete the flow yeah yeah so as and when uh, the client sends a request to the api gateway that this is the particular task i want to submit so the submit task service as it puts it into the database that is when it also notifies the task manager that i have submitted a task or the task manager can keep polling the database so we have these two approaches wherein one approach is that the submit task service notifies the task manager that, hey, a new task has been submitted and you can pull it up. But then this might overwhelm the task manager service. Why? Because it may get a lot of notifications from the submit task service, correct? Another uh, way can be that the task manager, it keeps pulling the database, say every five seconds, right? But then there can be a possibility that say for one hour, uh, no task has been submitted, but the task manager, it keeps pulling the database. So both of these approaches have their pros and cons. And for now, I'll go ahead with the approach wherein the task manager keeps pulling the database. The submit task service doesn't notify the task manager. They both are independent, right? Right. So, so the, one question here, right? So why does the submit task? So let's say the submit task service submits a task that has to be executed seven days later. Mm -hmm. So why does the task manager needs to be notified about it right now? That is what, like, you know, uh, because the task manager is the one who looks in uh, looks at the tasks in the database that okay these are the tasks and this is how i need to prioritize them i'm not uh, putting this responsibility of prioritizing the tasks on the submit task service i'm keeping it simple that it just persists those tasks into the database now to decide which task needs to be picked up first that has to be decided by the task manager right okay so even though this task should run seven days later still the task manager looks at the task is it uh, that uh, even though it has to be run seven days later, but then that will be decided by the task manager. Okay. Right. Yeah. 
so now uh, the task manager it pulls the database it sees that okay i have these many tasks so one thing that the task doesn't come into the queue of uh, task manager we can sort the task based on the uh, you know number of days we have for the task to be triggered say the time interval correct and if it is more than one then we do not give it to the task manager suppose there are five tasks and three tasks are there which need to be scheduled tomorrow so uh, we do not uh, like when the task manager queries the database we do not give those tasks to the data uh, to the task manager because they have they need to be scheduled tomorrow for today we have only two tasks so that is when the task manager picks up those tasks and sees that okay how much is the time it uh, he has uh, to uh, schedule those tasks he picks up those tasks and uh, from those you know it gets the information like what is the time that particular task needs to be scheduled at and uh, what is the geo distribution so one second right so from what you're saying the way i'm getting it is the mm -hmm. task manager looks at all the tasks that are supposed to be scheduled for today when yeah. it queries so you yeah, have it... like 100 million jobs that are supposed to be scheduled uh, every day right that's the qps that we uh, right uh, um, so which means so when it when it issues a query saying how many jobs have to run for today it's going to see that there are 100 million jobs that are ready to run for today right so every time see uh, we said that you know we are keeping the polling frequency as 5 seconds right but i see in this system 5 seconds is kind of you know too aggressive because we are picking up the jobs for a particular day so instead of say 5 seconds if we even keep it as 1 hour so in 1 hour it will be only fetching that delta because early in the morning when it for today when for the very first time when it ran it picked up a lot of jobs and it scheduled them now in the next one it need not pull those jobs again right because it has already scheduled them it only picks up those jobs uh, which are kind of new the okay. delta basically okay right okay so those are the ones that are that are to be scheduled um, maybe for the next few hours you mean yes because in the morning, say at 1 a.m., when it queried the database, it saw that, okay, there were these 500 jobs which which, which, were, which were in the database and whose status were kind of in progress, like they were accepted by the client, but they haven't been scheduled. So it picks up those jobs, it schedules them somehow, and it updates their uh, status to scheduled, correct? So now when it runs at 2 a.m., suppose 10 jobs were again submitted by some other client. So only those 10 jobs, they had their status as accepted, whereas others were already scheduled right mm -hmm. so it only picks up those 10 jobs the delta okay okay so i'm okay i see right and but then, then in this sorry go ahead so again like uh coming back to an earlier point right like it wouldn't pick up the jobs that are supposed to be scheduled even though it was submitted by the clients uh, in the mm -hmm. last uh, few hours it wouldn't pick it up if it was supposed to be scheduled for next day right so you're saying that it really right. okay Okay, so it'll also look at the time and and the and the status. Yes, the time and the status. Moreover, uh, one drawback I see here is suppose a client submits a task and that task needs to be say scheduled within next uh, next thirty minutes. But then since my task scheduler it is running every hour, so there can be a possibility that it misses those uh, jobs, right? So in that case, what we can do is uh, since we know that uh, my task scheduler it runs at an interval of t. And suppose when the task uh, submitter service, when it submits that particular task, it sees that uh, the threshold is that, you know, the interval, uh, the trigger time is less than that interval. That is when it can even notify the task manager service. So we want to follow a hybrid approach wherein if we see that we have a lot of time for this task to be scheduled, then the task manager can take care of that itself. Whereas, whereas if we see that the trigger time is less, then we delegate that uh, responsibility to the submit task service to notify the task manager that this is kind of a task which is just submitted by the user and it needs to be triggered within 30 minutes, right? So I think this is what makes uh, the system work for both of such scenarios. Okay. Right. So we were on the floor wherein the task manager pulls the list of those tasks and then it sees that this is the time I, uh, and just to in, uh, like uh, mention one more thing, all the times which we'll be having is will be UTC so that we need not do, do the time conversions and uh, just to keep away the confusion of the time zones, right? Sure. So when the task manager, it pulls those tasks from the database, it sees that uh, for today, these are the tasks I need to schedule and this is the time. And then it also sees the geo distribution basically 
where these tasks need to be distributed, where these tasks need to be executed, basically. So that is when, uh, suppose that task is, is supposed to be executed on all the data centers. And when I say all the data, data centers, assuming uh, it, we have five data cent centers, US, Europe, Asia, Japanese, and the Australian data center, that is when it kind of uh, fans out those task information into those data centers queue. Correct. Yeah, Every I think data are center... based on a requirement, sir. Like we didn't even talk about this. Right? I'm just saying. Like, uh, okay. It was it was so, a very simple. Uh, you know, sure. like it's a simple Let's keep it step. simple yeah. and yeah. on a particular data center. So it pulls up those tasks and it sees that I need to execute these tasks locally. So that is when it puts those tasks in, in, into the particular queue, right? And then it is the job of the task scheduler to pick those ta uh, tasks from the queue. So now. Uh, uh, the thing which we need to decide is how do we put it into the queue? Like, do we create different topics based on the tasks that, you know, uh, suppose we have say a hundred thousand clients. So do we create topics based on the clients or do we create topics based on the timestamps? So I think here, uh, more important is if we create uh, topics based on the timestamps, right? That is when the task scheduler can, because task manager has pushed all the tasks into the queue based on the uh, timestamps that uh, for uh, say 1 a.m. till 2 a.m. I have one topic then from 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. I have another topic now it is up to the task scheduler it knows that uh, the highest priority is 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, topic so it pulls the data from there and then schedules it right okay so so the the, the topics are time based yes the topics so, so there are different approaches the topics can be time based or they can be based on uh, say the task ID or like, you know, they can be completely random. So as of now, I think what makes more sense is to keep the topics time-based, but then this can lead to a hotspot issue wherein a lot of tasks, suppose they need to be executed between two, uh, four to five a.m., correct? Mm -hmm. Then there will be a lot of tasks, uh, like a lot of work for the task scheduler to perform at that particular time, right? So how do we take care of that? In that case, what we can do is we can, partition a particular topic if we see that there is a lot of data for that right and how uh, do we part yeah. mm -hmm. so the usually partitioning a topic is something that's pre-designed right like so we i don't think we can do it after we create the topic the number of partitions in the topic i believe it's usually right so instead of uh, like you know saying you know we can partition it what we can say is we can distribute it in different time windows and when i say we can distribute it in different time windows within a particular hour, we can further, you know, scale it so that the throughput increases. So suppose there were a lot of jobs between four to five, we can further split it, like, you know, how much is from four to 415, 415 to 430, so that we give some, you know, kind of breathing room to the task scheduler to pick up the most high priority tasks. And then gradually it picks up the ones which are near 5 a.m., right? Okay. So then the task scheduler picks up those jobs and then it fans out. Uh, now, uh, initially we said that we want to download the script and run it on the systems. So now uh, one more thing is how do we download those files on a lot of machines, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I said that, uh, remember in the uh, initially during the design discussion, we said that uh, the basic requirement is we basically want to download a particular script and run it on those systems. So this is what the task scheduler is doing, correct? Yeah. So one way to do this is uh, the task scheduler. Now it has to uh, kind of push this particular script on all the machines where this task has to be run, correct? So what it does is, uh, there can be multiple approaches of uh, pushing this file into the dedicated systems. One is that it is the total uh, sole responsibility of task scheduler to make sure that the file gets, uh, you know, uh, pushed to those systems. Or we can decentralize it by creating a hierarchical way wherein the task scheduler only pushes those files to say 10 of the machines which are very near to it. Then those 10 machines, they further push it down to the next set of machines, correct? So uh, I have one, one question, right? So, uh, uh, based on the requirements, a task is supposed to execute only on a single node, right? A single, we, we want to execute a task once on a single node, isn't it? Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. Um, sorry for the confusion. I thought like, uh, the task can execute on a lot of, uh, machines because it, I, I feel like, you know, it is a script, right? Just download a script and run. Yeah. Just download the script and run, right? Like, so. Okay. So if it has to be done on us. Mm-hmm. 
yeah it's basically yeah it's a it's basically just a job right like so we don't uh, um you simply like execute the instructions it's like a shell script kind of a sure, thing, sure 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 fine so now the task scheduler what it does is it knows that this is the particular script and this is where it needs to run this script so what it does is it connects to uh, that particular machine every machine will be having a small database in it which has the information of these are the tasks which need to be executed on this particular machine so it sends a request to that particular machine saying this is the particular task which needs to be executed at this particular time and when i say at this particular time suppose that a particular task was supposed to be executed at 11 am so instead of 11 am we keep the time as say 10:55 so uh, 10:15 uh, 10:59 for uh, 55 seconds so that at least it gets triggered 5 seconds before correct even though we have a leeway of 1 minute so i won't worry about this threshold we can even keep it as exactly 11 am and that is when we need to again have some process sitting on those dedicated nodes which make sure that at 11 am it triggers that script right so the task manager is going to push it to uh, a worker node right so right. multiple worker nodes so mm -hmm. so we have so from the task manager sorry the task scheduler is going to push it to multiple worker nodes the task scheduler yes and the worker nodes each would have a db where it would store this information yes and they will then, have a, a kind of a db or we can say it can maintain a data structure a heap data structure which has the like you know interval of uh, so it will be kind of the main heap wherein the uh, job which needs to be scheduled immediately that is at the top of it right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I that is how so. right so that is how it keeps pulling out the jobs from that particular heap and starts executing them i see i see i think okay right? but so mm -hmm. i think the overlap flow looks okay right the the one thing is like with your design uh like what happens if these uh if one of the worker nodes goes down Uh, the the worker task, nodes you mean yeah, where the, we are maintaining the heap, right? Yeah, exactly. Where we are maintaining right. the heap. Yeah. So now, what happens if that worker node goes down, or uh, let's start it uh, like you know at a more granular level? What happens if that particular heap goes down? Correct, because that heap is I'm assuming in memory. So what we do is we keep snapshots of that uh, heap, and instead of keeping that snapshot locally, we keep it in a distributed way so that tomorrow, even if that particular node goes down, we can have a backup node in. Uh, in the sense of an active and passive because there can be a possibility that the active node it just you know when it dies there are some tasks which need to be run say in the next second so that is when i want to keep a passive node which is almost you know uh, in sync with the active one and even if it goes down uh, it uh, the you know some coordinator service it gives the permission to the passive service to come up as an active node and that starts executing the task correct so just to provide a node I see. Every worker node has an active passive setup. They can be uh, two things. Either every worker node can have an active passive, or the active ones are dedicated. But then the passive ones can be shared, right? Because it is not that every uh, active one will uh, will go down at a particular time, right? Okay. Okay. So there'll be a few passive nodes which are few passive stored... nodes, but yeah, which okay. which store data for multiple active nodes. and when the active node goes down how does uh, uh, how do we know that uh, because we need to bring up a new active node right yes we need to bring up a new active or we need tell the passive node that hey for this particular active node now you are the active node and you are supposed to execute these tasks so let's assume there is a coordinator service for example a zookeeper so what happens is the active node it keeps sending its heartbeat to the zookeeper and in uh, say the heartbeat it senses at every 5 seconds and if there are three consecutive heartbeat misses misses in that case that coordinator service that will assume that the active node for this particular instance is down and that is when it looks up into its mapping table and see okay for this active one i have this machine as a dedicated passive that is when it connects to it and gives the permissions that you are allowed to execute the task for this active id okay fair enough yeah sure so the um Uh, the other question is um, when the querier the task manager um, queries the task database right mm -hmm. so uh, let's say there is a task that um, uh, that was submitted at let's say uh, whatever 5 pm right so but uh, it was submitted at 5 pm 3 uh, days back and the instruction is to 
run this task every 30 minutes okay so till now we were only talking about the task which 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 were like you know which was supposed to be executed once now talking okay. about the reoccurring task the in that ones, case yeah, yeah mm -hmm. reoccurring ones so uh, one way i can think of it is for reoccurring tasks one is either we insert that many records for every day correct into the database like one record say suppose the task is supposed to run for every day once mm -hmm. once uh, say 5 pm every day so we insert that many records into the database one is that way another way can be uh, when the task manager it pulls up those tasks it sees that this is the reoccurring task and this is the interval when it needs to do that so instead of inserting so many records into that say, uh, database instead of that what i feel is a better solution is it puts that task into the queue which which gets picked up by the task scheduler and when the task scheduler pushes up into that dedicated node so we handle this responsibility at the dedicated node itself saying that now it is the dedicated nodes uh, responsibility to schedule it every 30 minutes right suppose it was supposed to run say after every 30 minutes so now uh, the dedicated node which had that small database and a uh, heap uh, data structure there we can have a dedicated service there which keeps pulling that task again from the database and sees that okay it was supposed to run at say 5 pm and then 5 30 and then at 6 so that is when it keeps uh, you know putting it into the heap and sends the uh, status back to this task scheduler or some other service which keeps updating its uh, you know status in the task db saying that uh, this this was its runtime at 5 30 and this is the status i see the system but don't you think it's a little bit too complicated you know like we have a scheduling stuff that already happens by looking at the task db and then now we are pushing this the scheduling stuff back to worker nodes right worker nodes are simply supposed to just execute the tasks right i mean like even i see uh, this thing to be a little complicated like you know entangled kind of a thing yeah. uh because uh like when i was talking about that you know the status gets updated at, at that time i felt that once we update the status like even though we said that we do not want to keep that many records into the database but then to update their status that this task was executed at 5 5 30 for the end user to know that you know for uh for this particular task how many runs were successful and how many failed we need to have those many rows, correct? So even I feel instead of delegating that task to that worker node, it's better the task manager and the task scheduler, uh, they, you know, take care of those tasks, like you know, inserting those many records seems a better solution, even though it'll take much more space, but then it'll keep the logic simple. True. So basically we kind of have a single responsibility, right? So yeah. Right. Uh, so we talked about like, you know, how the task gets submitted, how it gets pulled by the task manager, the task scheduler, and how we, you know, run it on a particular node. So we even talked about how do we provide fault tolerance at the worker level, but then we haven't talked about uh, the fault tolerance at the queue level or the database level. So do you have anything specific in mind, like for me to cover or like which thing, like, do you want me to talk about? Uh, I think with rest of the overall flow we are good right so i think that's good so um yeah so the task managers i think we toss we already talked about the fault tolerance at the scheduler level right so at the manager level uh probably that's something that might um fine so now at the task uh, manager level uh providing fault tolerance again uh so taking this we see that there is the skew in between and the task manager is behaving like publisher and the task scheduler is kind of a consumer. So there can be a possibility that my producer goes down, the publisher goes. Basically the task manager, if it goes down, what happens to those tasks, correct? So it picked up that task from the database, it updated it and it pushed it into the queue. The task was accepted by the queue, but then before it could have updated its status in the database, it went down, right? So mm -hmm. assuming now we bring up a new task manager the task manager again goes into the database and pulls that task again and pushes into the queue so how do we remove this duplicacy right so in that case what we can do is we can uh, implement idempotency and by idempotency i mean that once a particular task has been pulled from the task db so it will have a particular task id and when the task manager it pushes that task id into the queue that is when it checks whether that same task id is already present or no if it is already present in the queue, then it doesn't put it. It doesn't put that uh, you know uh, this task into the queue. So is that functionality something that normally queues provide? Saying hey, is this record in the queue? 
uh, uh as far as i remember like this is not provided by the queue even though uh, every task manager every publisher they have their unique id along with that they generate the sequence id correct so here instead of generating a unique sequence id a monotonically increasing sequence id i would prefer keeping the task id to maintain the identity right mm -hmm. so uh, uh, i mean i'm not aware of it but what i feel is that the queue might not provide this functionality it is up to the publisher the producer to implement this functionality that what kind of uh, you know structure we want to have like uh, just to give an example of uh, you know some commercial products like they give the feasibility of uh, at least once or at max once that we want to persist the data or exactly once so this is the concept of exactly once how do we actually implement it so it is all dependent upon the publisher right whether it waits for an acknowledgement or it doesn't wait for an acknowledgement and in case it is exactly once then how does it implement it right right so in this case because we can't query the queue for a specific task id right so even um do you think it's still possible to achieve that exactly one semantic yeah? uh i mean it cannot query that queue but then we can still maintain some external data structure which has all the task ids which have been submitted into the queue something kind of a wall right even though we cannot query the queue that hey what all tasks have been submitted to you we can at least look into the wall and see that whether this particular task id was submitted or no and okay, putting so a particular task id into a wall and then into a queue that will be kind of an atomic operation and by atomic i mean either they both succeed or none of them right so uh, based on what you said right like so we put it into the wall and then we put it into the queue so every time uh, before I, I i i i i try to put something into the queue i have to look into the wall right uh, right so but the wall is not something you usually uh, read from right so uh, wall doesn't support uh, efficient reads right so you have to scan the entire wall to kind of right right uh, yeah i'm getting so at how, that yeah You're right. So, I mean, ultimately, which means you have to maintain a kind of uh, data because in the queue, you can't so actually like queue supports it. So we can talk it after the interview. So Kafka, sure. like you, you can, you can overwrite a specific key. If, if, if another one that comes with the same key and if the record is still there. So, uh, uh -huh. um, uh, Kafka would basically uh, overwrite that record with a new record because it's the same key kind of a thing, but, uh, but it, you only do it if that record is there, let's say, uh, your um, your uh, scheduler already picked it up from the queue then then now you try to put it now this will actually go in because it's not there in the queue anymore right so uh, right, so, yeah, right. So the, now the, exactly that is another flow, flow wherein uh, the that particular task that was picked up by the scheduler right right so in right case, so in that case what happens is when the scheduler picks it up from the uh, queue before picking it up from the queue it even connects to the database back and then again it is an atomic operation that it pulls from the queue and updates its status in the database saying this has been picked and since its status has been picked so the task manager won't be picking it up again right so that is how we provide coordination between the task manager and the task scheduler okay yeah sure yeah i think um... Like, do you have more things? I think uh, that's all from mine. So, fine. I mean, like, uh, I have a lot, lot of things. Like, you know, we can talk about uh, how do we maintain, uh, like, what kind of architecture would be preferred for the database. So, just to take yeah, one more minute. Ahead. So, I think it is kind of a pretty design. Like, we do not have that much records. So, a normal relational database would be fine in that case with a leader follower. Why would I go with a leader follower? Because I do not see that many writes. The writes are less, but then the reads might be much more because the users might be querying the status. And we have a, uh, you know, flexibility of one minute, uh, the SLA time. So that is when, even if taking uh, like the maximum delay, there can be like you know, in an idle scenario, it can be maximum around two hundred to three hundred milliseconds for the data to flow from the leader to the follower. So the view status service, instead of querying the leader, it will be going to the followers to see what is the status of a particular task. And that is how we will be providing eventual consistency. And remember, one of our requirements was to when a particular user submits a task and immediately he queries, so he shouldn't go back in time. So in, the, in those cases, for newly submitted tasks, instead of going to the replica, one way to solve this issue is to directly query the leader or to keep the newly submitted task status into a cache. So I would not uh, like, you know, try to complicate it 
better to go to that leader for say for the tasks which have been submitted in the previous uh, one minute rather than like you know creating a cache for this thing rest i think uh, we are able to cover our functional and non-functional requirements so yeah i'm going with this cool awesome job uh mind it's also i think um thanks guys before yeah so i think the uh the uh i mean i think uh the i think the one thing is um uh, i just wanted to kind of uh highlight right so uh for the solution of you know like how do we um maintain um, um a recurring job uh, uh you know like we have to create so many duplicate records for all let's say it's a, a job has to be run every five minutes right right so then we have to uh, and it's and it's an ever it's an ever uh, there is no deadline for the job it simply has to run every five minutes that's it like so i mean there are some there has there could be some jobs like that right the job has to run every one hour and it just has to keep on going right like it doesn't have an right. end right so in right. which case we don't know how many records to create and stuff right like so right. that kind of thing right so i think one thing that we can use over there is like instead of creating those mini like uh, uh when we take that specific when we when the when the task manager looks at that uh, uh, and then it actually takes it right so that's when it actually goes out for scheduling uh, for its mm -hmm. for its current run so at that time we can simply create the next record alone because we know what the okay. when then when the next one right like so we can simply create right. the next so when the first one goes out you can create the second one the second one goes out right. you can create the third one all right like so uh that's basically exactly what you said it's just a suggestion on so, right 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 yeah this so, sounds much better rather than creating like you know so many records in one go right you can just create the next one so that uh you know like you okay at least the next one is already there and any of the task manager somehow will pick it up at, at its appropriate time so when it does that it'll again recreate the next one after that right? so that's one thing i had and then other than that i think um so this um Uh, i think the the old concept of uh, you know like the worker nodes kind of having uh, internal heap by themselves and then you know like having an active and a passive over there right that looked a little bit more complicated okay like each worker node uh, uh, like uh, you know like uh, each worker node kind of having an active and a passive and then uh, uh, and then to to even enable that active passive you have a zookeeper system behind that right right uh, uh, to enable that right so that looked a little bit uh, complicated kind of a thing so uh, maybe we can think of uh, other ways of you know the worker now i mean like uh, in a very uh, simple way worker nodes job should simply be to uh, 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 you know like everything that Just is executed exactly everything that is there in the queue is ready for execution you go grabs grab the next one in the queue take it execute it done bro grab the next one in the queue take it it should be as simple as that right like because uh, uh, the queue already has all the tough stuff that us I mean, if we make sure that the queue all only has stuff that are ready for execution uh, at this specific moment right like so whatever mm -hmm. is ready for it then the worker nodes job is much more reduced they don't have to maintain that heap of when someone has to execute or when someone so that that thing is now pushed down to the queue right the queue already has everything that is executable and then you know like your your worker fleet literally has to you know like uh, 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 pick the one and then execute it right so then a little bit more logic has to go down into the task manager as to when to put these guys into the queue because now we only want to put the guys who are ready for execution into the queue right? okay so, so you are saying instead of proactively pushing all those tasks into the worker nodes we push them as in when their time is about to be triggered is it exactly that? as and when when they are about to uh, uh, and for example a task that are supposed to run at 5 o'clock right so mm -hmm. uh, your task manager can look at the tasks that are about to run at 5 o'clock and simply push them into okay. the queue right mm -hmm. so uh, uh, right. and then your worker nodes can simply feed them off right so uh, and right. then at 5:1 so now your task manager schedule you remember like you 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 kind of made a hybrid structure right like so where right. you know like the ones which are like less than 30 minutes will directly go to the task manager others will go to the task db kind of thing so instead of that now this is also a little bit more uh, uniform way of you know like uh, uh, every minute you know like uh, uh, and of course uh, this task manager is a service right it's it's this if, if every minute if there's only one thread that is kind of looking 
looking at uh, the DB to see who are all eligible, and then uh, if it tries to you know like do that, it may not be work. It may not work out, right? So you need to have multiple uh, as part of the task manager service. There should be like multiple uh, uh, instances that are actually doing this, that are looking at different partitions of your DB. And and, mm -hmm. and and pulling the eligible ones alone, right? Like so, pull the eligible ones alone, push push it into the queue, right? So now your queue simply contains everything that is eligible, and your work, and you can increase your worker node heat as much, you know, like the moment you see that, you know, your queue is getting a little bit, uh, uh, the offset lag, the what they call is the top mm -hmm. of the offset. Right? If the offset lag of the queue increases, you know that you need to increase your worker nodes, right? Because the offset lag right. exactly describes how many are pending to be executed that are actually supposed to be executed, right? So okay. they can actually have an alert on the offset lag immediately as soon as the offset lag, you know, increases beyond, let's say, you know, like 500 or whatever it is, right? So based on um, empirical results uh, or some experimentation, right? So then you would spin up another node because you know that, you know, at this particular point in time, for whatever reason, the number of tasks that needs to be executed is really high. So let's, so dynamically you can increase your, your worker nodes and then you can dynamically, uh, your worker nodes can also decrease uh, depending upon how much your offset lag is. Right, so I mean, these are just suggestions to uh, yeah. what what you kind of mentioned. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, I think it was a pretty. Uh, um, so then, with the last thing that you know, we only push it as and when it is about to be triggered. A uh, one trade off I see in that is suppose there is a network break, correct? Yes. Between the task scheduler and those worker nodes, suppose it is not able to communicate, then. We might miss our SLA had it been we had proactively, you know, push them into those worker nodes way ahead of time. And then if we go ahead with the previous design of maintaining a heap or some other kind of a data structure, then at least we are uh, kind of safe that we will be meeting our SLA. That is the only thing I feel uh, we can discuss with the interviewer at that time. Otherwise, like, you know, both the designs, they seem fine to me. Like one is little complicated, other, is, other one is quite simplistic, right? Yeah. I think uh, people in the audience had some questions. So let's, uh... Okay, so I'll just go through the questions. Like if, uh, like if anyone has any suggestions or any questions, we can go or like I can talk about the thing in the chat. So there is one question: How about a column for each run? instead of a row for each run. Uh, yeah, actually, I was thinking uh, if you are using some Cassandra-like structure, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of you are thinking, uh, so instead of having um, a row for every run, actually, you keep adding a column. OK. So uh, then, uh, like, I was thinking it in the terms of uh, the task being the task ID as you know for that particular row but now you are saying that we'll keep it based on the time that okay at 10 a.m these were the tasks which are which were supposed to be executed and then you keep on putting a yes or a no whether which one has succeeded or no right no, no, keep I increasing agree. the no no I, so no actually so you 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 gave the client a, a task ID right right so task ID will be the key mm -hmm. and let's say the the user wants to run it actually every one hour or something yeah so you will have 24 columns after a day's run okay for that key mm -hmm. so okay. the issue issue is actually if you uh, let's say if you want if you are splitting every run as individual task id right then client won't know actually what is the task id of my next run right right now we we keep the task id item potent or make 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 it fixed and actually you keep adding the adding the columns to that Right. Yeah. Yeah, that is uh, something I wanted to discuss earlier. Actually, when the interviewer was saying, actually, you create create a new task uh, based. If it is going to run five times a day, actually, when you pick the first task, you create a, another one in the database. Right. Now, mm -hmm. now you have to have a mapping. Actually, what is my original task ID and what is the new task ID that are created after that? Okay, the parent and the child relationship. Yeah. Right. That yeah, this exactly. was the parent ID. Yeah. Okay, Otherwise, actually, clients won't won't be able to query it. So, in such a scenario, I feel like you know it's better to go ahead with a columnar database, like you know this 
Cassandra. Why? Because had it been a secure, no uh, alter this relational database, then we were restricted by the number of columns. But then in Cassandra at runtime, suppose a particular task that is supposed to run every five minutes, correct? Mm -hmm. So yeah. we can add those many columns without any restri restriction. Exactly. Yeah. So the other thing is like, uh, if if a client wants to query the history of the task runs, right? I don't think they will actually be querying this task DB for that specific purpose. You will have a journal database that actually stores all the task runs uh, that, that got completed or that failed or whatever it is. And, and those queries would actually be directed to those uh, a journal database that you would maintain, right? Like, because this task DB, you should not pollute this task DB with respect to this task DB specifically for the task manager to figure out what tasks to run uh, at the next instance, right? So what happened to those tasks uh, for a specific client? What tasks actually ran? What is the next task to run? So all those particular uh, uh, information, right? Like, so those should be completely maintained in a different database. It wouldn't yeah. be in this one. Yeah, I totally agree that that is the, that other database or, or what I was talking is about the Cassandra, right? Let's say here in this case, right? The task DB that is a C, uh, let's say that is a not, uh, regular RDBMS, right? So let's say I want to run the task uh, 24 times a day. That means actually every hour I need to run. So when, like you said, actually, when you pick up the first task out of that, mm -hmm. there is a task ID, right? The primary yeah. key must be mostly a task ID, right? Then I pick it up. Then I have to create another record for the next hour of run, right? Then I have to create a new yeah. task ID, right? Uh, now uh, we... Yeah, so in that specific case, your primary key may not be uh, just the task ID alone, right? Like, so because, uh, um, uh, like, you you can, uh, um, like, so again, like, for this specific database, right? Like, so... Do I have to query? Will there ever be a case where I'll have to query this database using a task ID? Uh, sorry, say it again. So for this particular database, which is actually uh -huh. used to input a new task, and then it is used by the task manager to see at a given, let's say, because the task manager, let's say, looks at every minute to see what are the current eligible tasks, right? So uh -huh. like, is there, a, is there a requirement to input a task ID and then get the details out of this? Uh, you mean in the in the for this particular thing? data yeah for this particular database right probably we don't have to query by task ID at all. But actually, you gave the client a task ID, right? Client only knows about the task ID. Uh, yes. Yeah. So you need to be, so the search criteria is now so the task ID unless you create some secondary index or something. Like no, no, the client, the yeah, job. but. Yeah, the client will use the task ID to query, but they don't have to query this database. That's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, I agree, actually. So that's why MindPixel was saying, actually, you create a row for every run in a, in another another table or somewhere. Right, right. I think he was suggesting the same table, I guess. Uh, no, actually, I was selling, actually, instead of adding a row for every run, right? That, that Basically, you are kind of... Uh, Basically, let's say if you are adding every each row for every run, right? Then we have to define the primary key as the uh, the task ID and the time it ran. Uh, I was saying actually, the instead of that, actually we can use a column database. So the primary key will still be the task ID. Then you keep adding the rows, sorry, the columns as the runs. Uh, just as a suggestion, actually, yeah. Okay. Okay. But not in this database, right? It's a no, no, no. The it's journal database. database right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, some status database or somewhere. Uh, the other thing I want to ask, actually, so uh, how do you how do you make sure that actually this design is maintaining the SLA, right? I was expecting to see actually some mathematical proof, actually, or something. How do we prove that actually? That is one thing actually normally comes up. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, because if the queue is too big, right? If the items in the queue is too big to be uh, run in one minute, right? Let's say the things has to be scheduled for 5.30 and, uh, it, and now we have only one minute SLA time to finish this. The mathematical proof is for what? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't catch you. Yeah, so to how do we- Make sure that we run all of the tasks within the SLA. Exactly. 
Okay. The offset lag is for that specific purpose, right? Like, so once you know that your queue, your queue starts building up, you can increase the number of worker nodes. That's horizontally scalable. Yeah. So uh, when you say increase the number of worker nodes, is it those task schedulers? We no, increase no, the no, number no. of task schedulers to no, not the tasks sca- from the queue. No, no, not not the task schedulers, right? It's the it's the final, the last uh, set of okay. the actual worker Where nodes actually, that are executed. Yeah. yeah. The, the basically the consumers of your uh, of your queue, right? Like so. Uh, uh, the consumers of your queue, the number of consumers that you want, let's say your queue always is going to have uh, five tasks, right? Mm-hmm. So that kind of determines how many worker nodes you actually need to, uh, you know, like uh, uh, to to literally uh, uh, drain the queue within that one particular minute, right? That's our SLO, right? Like so, uh, um, so if this specific number increases, then you might have to increase the number of worker nodes, right? Like based yeah, on some. Some, some feedback loop actually yeah yeah some feedback loop should yeah that that alert yeah. should trigger right like so and then that alert should basically uh, uh, increase that uh, number of workers kind of thing right so i think especially uh, when uh, this is a pretty common problem in kafka right like so uh, like the number of partitions that you actually even you create a topic itself the number of partitions that you create like uh, the kafka guide basically states that it is based on both the number of the how much throughput that you want to get through that specific uh, uh, queue, right? Like, so uh, uh, a specific uh, uh, record goes into the queue and then a consumer picks it up from the queue. Now, the number of partitions that you need defines the actual parallelism also, right? Like, so uh, so that number of partitions has to be based on some estimation on the parallelism that we might need both on the writer side and on the consumer side. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's right. So I think the number of partitions that is based on the number of consumers we have in that group, correct? Because if we have more consumers than the partitions, then they start, uh, then they keep sitting idle, correct? Yeah, you. Yeah, there is no, there is no reason to have more consumers than the number of partitions. Yeah. So uh, your number of partitions will literally define the max cap of uh, total number of consumers, consumers that you have per yeah. consumer group. Yeah. Uh, but actually, if you use Kafka, right? That actually, then it 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 is a so every client has their own index, right? It is nobody is nobody stepping on each each other, right? Then there is an issue of duplicate task runs, right? I so think we have this, yeah. yeah. In this model, actually, we can't use the Kafka, right? We yeah. have to use yeah. something. Yeah. I think yes. for a task, usually for the task thing, I I believe a Rabbit MQ kind of a thing. Is probably more uh, appropriate than a Kafka kind of thing. Okay. But then, why will they be duplicates? I didn't get that. Um, because actually, so um, if we we both are actually the consumers from a same uh, same same Kafka partition or somewhere, right? So mm-hmm. you will have an uh, you will you you keep your uh, own index actually where you are in that queue, and I also keep my own. So if I you take one. From the first task from the the partition, I should be taking the two. Right. Because yeah, because we both are individually keeping our own index. You will keep taking one, two, three. I will also keep keep taking one, two, three. Right, right, right. No, but right. but if but if there are two consumers that mm-hmm. are subscribed to this particular Kafka topic, right? The mm-hmm. here obviously we will not have multiple consumer groups there, right? Because we don't want an item to be processed more than once. More so, than once, yes. Yeah, single right? so consumer, consumer group with multiple consumers. consumers. With multiple consumers. And Kafka guarantees that a partition will never be assigned to more than any consumer. That's a that's how they, they operate, right? So yeah. at a particular point in time, if you have only one CG, it will always be that uh, a consumer, I mean, a partition will always be looked upon by a by one consumer. A single consumer can look at multiple partitions. That is that is that is okay, right? But yeah, the yeah. same that, partition a, will not yeah. that's a problem, right? Actually. So if there is only one consumer, we won't get the throughput, right? Uh, we have no, one but consumer we'll have group, multiple but consumers in that, the same consumer group. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So suppose you have 10 topics, correct? Uh-huh. 24 topics based on every R, and you have one consumer group with 24 uh, consumers inside that, correct? Mm, okay, I see. Mm. Yeah, we just uh, yeah. If if everybody is uh, so, if each consumer within a consumer group is consuming only one of those messages, then it's good actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, that is uh, guaranteed. Yeah, that is okay. that is kind of guaranteed in fact. Okay. I 
Okay, that was the question. How does it maintain the cellular form? Okay. Thank you. Man Pixel, any other conclu concluding notes from you? Looks like uh, the question is much like yeah i uh, one thing i wanted to talk about is like uh, i didn't talk about the database design moreover we didn't do much of the calculations we we did very less of that so is that acceptable in an interview because generally i have seen if i spend a lot of time on schema design and then these estimates like say if i even takes five to seven minutes in two of these activities even though the interview might not be interested like as i saw from your discussion you are more interested in how this task scheduler and the task a manager they are working correct so that is when i said let's jump over it let's first of all resolve your queries and then in case we have time we'll come back but i know like you know we never had that time left that you know to come back to those things so is yeah. that fine i think in this specific case right the reason like to make sure that we have a working solution right like so we have to go through the complete flow right like so what happens like uh sometimes uh, uh 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 in general like uh not in this interview but but sometimes what happens is, like people simply say you know what i'll put this here then i'll take this from there and then this will come and take it from there and thing right like so but only if you go through in detail as to hey what when you say you put this here like what do you mean when you say you take it from here right? like when you when you when you start uh pushing the candidate as to just to make sure that the candidate knows what uh he's talking about and the implications of what he's talking about right just to get that you know like uh, he's not saying something uh, simply or without understanding uh, the implications of it uh, um like especially mm -hmm. for this particular thing for example like uh, how do you handle the recurring ones right like so uh, 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 that is when you know like the candidate gets presented with a very interesting question now right like so like like i think you had that dilemma right hey you know what right. do i have to create a record for every single recurring one or uh, you know like uh, i think you came up with a solution of pushing that to the worker node yes. itself right like so yeah. in order if if i have to get through that that all particular you know just the flow of you know like uh, to support my end to end flow itself right like so i think uh, i at least needed the time to go through that in detail kind of a thing right but in this right. one, like i think we had like 100 million uh, per uh, per day right so which means that that right. 100 million is not the number of uh, the 100 million is just the number of jobs that will be scheduled per day right right like so uh, uh, which essentially means that uh, 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 your task manager which runs every minute uh, if you look at it so uh, we can we can make that calculation right like so uh, let's say that 100 million is not distributed uniformly and then yeah. you know like there is like uh, uh, there is there is like one stretch of time uh, maybe you know like four hours which is like at the peak time right so which means because it's 4 hours and 24 hours which means like if you divide that 100 million uniformly it's actually coming down to 100 into uh, 10 right which is like 1000 per second then you can actually put that 6x multiply which is like 6000 per second so you can basically say that you know even in peak times when the task manager runs uh, it's it will look at 6000 records per second or something like that right so uh, depending upon the granularity right so including the peak multiplier right so uh, right. then the question is like are we Are we, how do we uh, handle that? I mean, can the task manager handle it uh, consistently and uh, and those kind of things? Right. So, and even when querying, uh, I think when querying a one million record database, it's probably okay uh, as to how it is. But I would say that it would be uh, if there is a clustering problem on the date, uh, the date plus time, basically the timestamp at which uh the task has to be executed right then the querying will be much more smoother right like so the query would literally have to uh, because there is a clustering column on the specific time stamp uh, mm -hmm. the query simply has to just look at uh, in order right? like so uh, you know like uh, the starting of you know 500 to 501 if it's looking at one yeah. interval right so right yeah otherwise it might have to look at the entire database to get the records that are eligible to be scheduled in that specific moment okay yeah that was i was about in the first question i was about in the chat right actually let's say you give a maximum deadline for a job submission right let's say for 5:30 run actually 
max uh, sorry the the latest you can submit the job is five uh, five fifteen or something then the scheduler has like that uh, that scheduler manager has some 15 minutes to go through the database and fetch what it is needs to be run at 5 30 right otherwise actually if you keep allowing uh, people to submit jobs now and there actually then it would be difficult yeah i think like this this was a miss like no i should have asked it in the functional requirements that what is the you know maximum uh, like the last time we can, uh, you know, accept the job, and after which yeah. we stop receiving the request, saying that now it's too, you know, short for that job to be accepted. Yeah, I agree yeah. that you know I should have asked that in the functional requirements. Yeah, that would have made your uh, actually your design a little bit easier. Actually, now instead of going that hybrid model, you could have concentrated on one side. Yeah. Yeah. I think executing that every minute, you know, like for the for for the list of jobs that are to be scheduled for the next minute, right? So that would be like a very plain model. Yeah. Right. So you just find the tasks that are to be executed, put them in the queue, and then your worker notes will literally feed off from the queue. But again, it might be too simplistic for some of the scenarios as well. So. Yeah. I think uh, if you schedule uh, in, in YouTube and all, actually, if you schedule something, actually, they there is a restriction. Actually, the earliest time you can schedule something, let's say you want to go go live on something, right, with a video. Um, so that's, I think that, that's what they are doing. Okay. So that's, that's actually for, uh, uh, for live video thing. Right? Uh, live video meaning actually you want to publish a video at uh, one particular time. Oh, so, I see. I yeah. See. I see. Okay. yeah. Uh, you, you schedule everything, but there is a deadline on actually how early is, so how the latest you can do that. You cannot go at 5.29 and say, actually, I want to publish it at 5.30. That's the buffer they need. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so you said actually the consistency model, actually you need to, the user has to see what they have written, right? Right. Okay, and so uh, that actually, so you solved it using the, the the SQL database, so that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, so if, yeah, if it had been a NoSQL, actually probably you may need to, you, um, somewhere you were mentioning actually, the reads has to go to the leader, right? Uh, for the like one minute or something. Yeah, for re reading your own rights, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, how, how normally you get a follow up actually, how would you do that? Right. So we, I mean, like, uh, this concept is mentioned in DDIA. I haven't implemented it practically, but then what they say is like, when you want to do that, so you keep uh, this information somewhere in your application that, okay, these are the requests which have recently been like, you know, just putting it in some cache in the memory saying that these are the requests which have just been persisted. And if the same task ID is queried again, you see whether it is in the cache, it means it was just inserted. That is when you route it to the leader rather than the follower, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I understand that part, right? Actually, that that only means actually the the client for that system is kind of a, a non-movable entity, right? Let's say, uh, yeah, I have two systems. I can uh, I can use the same user ID or the authentication you're using, right? I have a laptop and a phone. I submitted using my laptop and I'm checking with my phone what is the status, right? Right. No, we have a problem actually. We cannot, because all the information you said is right, right now on my, my laptop client. Right. Okay, yeah, so how we can solve that problem? If that is so in that case, actually, but then yeah. like you know even if you are querying using your mobile device still you need that particular task id correct yeah so but that... actually mm -hmm. yeah but actually the task id is fine right 
but uh, there is no guarantee that actually the task id the, the replica you are connecting to doesn't may not have that task id replicated already right in that case like uh, instead of maintaining uh, this information in memory locally on a particular node we can keep it globally right yeah that that, that, that means actually you have to push uh, push the client state to the so yeah, instead right. of making it making it stateful yeah that is the thing because yeah, if you put it on the local servers then you will be making it stateful right yeah cool yeah that's fine yeah something to discuss actually yeah So I think uh, one thing here, right, is normally when we design an application, for example, right, so um, let's say in general itself, right, so not specific to this, but in general itself, right, like, so um, unless it's a um, distributed system design kind of a thing, right, so um, if it's an application kind of a design, would we be uh, um, generally, uh, doing i mean i think we would just set the policies as uh, a masters and replicas and whether reads can go to the replicas and stuff right let's say it's a database for example. we are writing into a database right let's let's say it's a cassandra mm -hmm. database right so um, normally the application will not be aware of you know like the replicas and uh, the master and all these things right like so mm -hmm. as an at, at the application level we will not we will uh, we will query the distributed database, which gives us some some guarantees, right? So uh, and uh, and how we set the uh, parameters for the distributed database uh, will determine uh, what kind of consistency that we will get, right? Like so, I'm just asking. Like normally, that's how we would uh, um, the application will not be exposed to the internals of uh, a database, like the number of replicas it has and you know like uh, where should this specific query should go to that kind of a thing right? the application is right. query the, the database or you know like the specific external but then system. if you think about it like you know in our organization what we are doing is we know that we have two flavors of the database one is the read instance and another one is the write instance now for write there can be multiple nodes which we are not aware of and even for reading there are multiple nodes which we are not aware of but then in our application, what we generally do is we create two connections. One is with the write instance and another one is with the read instance. Now it it, it depends upon which write, write is pointing to which particular node, correct? That is hidden, but then what is exposed is there are these two variables. One is the write instance and another one is the read instance. You create instance to both of them, even though you need not query the write instance, correct? Because your application is only reading the data. But in right. some scenarios, it happens that another application which had persisted the data into the database using the right instance and like in our organization what happens is it takes around 10 seconds for the data to get replicated to all the read instances and if your application is of that sort that you know it cannot wait for those 10 seconds then we prefer connecting to the right instance and read, read the data because otherwise what happens is your application inserted the data and immediately when you query it you go to mm -hmm. the read instance and the data is not present there correct so you go back in time of that sort that you know you just inserted it you got a success but then you're not seeing the data okay so when you mean there's write instance and read instance like you're talking about the replicas and the master is it yes yes okay and what database is this uh like in our uh, organization we are using a relational database that is cybase hello, hello. Yeah. Oh, okay so, okay hello yeah hey we can hey. hear you uh, yeah, 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 I just want to like add uh, to what you guys were talking about. So, uh, you know, the, he was asking whether the complexity is exposed to the application developer, right? That's where comes like uh, the middleware libraries, like uh, which are common for all the microservices. Like that's how we have like uh, there are like uh, 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 I mean all the microservices like use uh, these common middleware libraries. Uh, so that uh, the complexity of uh, read and write, all of that is uh, uh, the complexity of the distributed databases is abstracted from the application developer. Okay, there is one more angle to it. Like, uh, let's say, for example, in in Redis, uh, let's say we are, uh, you know, Redis basically like we we uh, we. We lost you. Yeah. yeah. Which shard has the data, right? Because that decision making 
have have uh, being proxied uh, add, adds additional latency. So that's why like uh, the client itself is aware of all the partitions, which uh, key should go to uh, which uh, you know uh, 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 which node. Uh, and and whenever the rebalancing has happened on the Redis side, right, uh, the client would know by means of a notification. Uh, so that uh, you know that thing is advertised and and next time again when we want to go for a particular key, uh, you know we, we wouldn't like proxy the decision making and rather like reduce the latency by uh, sending uh, the uh, sending the request to the appropriate node. So yeah, I just wanted to like add uh, my perspective of uh, you know different flavors of uh, exposing the complexity. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. No, that's that's actually that's that's actually good. Yeah, I I can now relate to what you're saying. I, I think thanks. Yeah. So I think the client library kind of abstracts a lot of things. That's right. Like so, like you mentioned in the Redis client, like the client library itself would would take care of it. Right, right, right. Yeah, and, and not just this, uh, not just access to the database. Uh, other things like uh, uh, observability, right? Uh, that's mm -hmm. also like uh, your app, uh, let's say like, you know, you're writing your microservice, like let's say Spring Boot, Java-based service, right? Uh, so I, I, so at least like in our organization, uh, like there is a common uh, Docker container that all these microservice owners like, you know, inherit so that they get this common functionality, like exposing the metrics and all those things. Uh, uh, so th these are like the cross cutting concerns of all microservices, right? Not just one service. So it won't be reinvented for every, uh, you know, uh, for every service. So, yeah. So there won't be uh, uh, any uh, um, metric related code in the application, is it? Right. You would have to send, right? Right, right, right. No, no, you would have to send it, but that's decoup uh, that, that's given to you as an API. Uh, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that's basically decoupled, so like you can use like any system, but uh, uh, but but I mean, each uh, service owner doesn't have to like reinvent from scratch. Hmm. Yeah. The common set of libraries that they will. Uh, uh, yes. They will... yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In both companies that have worked, I have seen this. Like, there will be like all these cross-cutting con concerns. They are written in the form of some commons libraries, and uh, then like all the service owners would uh, uh, would just use them uh, in a consistent way. Yeah. Okay. So, is Redis using a Zookeeper or in anything like that for this uh, notification? So, uh, no. No, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't think Redis is uh, Redis has two types of clustering. Like one is the Redis cluster, like which are like the uh, 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 sorry, okay, okay, let's not get into that. So to 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 answer your question, uh, no, uh, the cons the, the the there is no external data store that uh, helps for consensus. Uh, it is baked in uh, like uh, in the, in the, it's it's baked in the Redis uh, base software itself. Uh, it does not use any, it uses like gossip, like uh, each node uh, makes, uh, you know, cons keeps consistently sending uh, these ping and pings to like this N minus one rest of the pods and and get the, get the acknowledgement. So uh, that's how it's done. Mm. Okay. Cool, thanks. And same is the case with MongoDB too. Like I've used MongoDB. There is like this consensus happening every time. There is a leader, but uh, uh, all these things, all these uh, nodes are always uh, uh, communicating and, uh, and maintaining a consensus about who the leader is. Uh, uh, it's also like a variation of a raft or something, but uh, there is no external uh, data store used. Uh, and other people can correct me uh, because some of you have talked about Kafka, right? Uh, Kafka in the previous versions, it used to have Zookeeper to maintain that uh, state, like who is who, like who is leader, who is master, and uh, those partitions, I believe. And 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 I heard in the recent versions, it's not like that. It, Zookeeper is not being used. I agree. Yeah, yeah. So they, they came up with Zookeeper the, now. They came up with something called Craft, which is basically Kafka Raft. <laughs> so they, uh, but it's not production ready uh, as of the latest Kafka version but uh, maybe in the next Kafka release it will be production ready I, guess. I think that is the difference between Zookeeper and Raft right like so if you're using Zookeeper you're you getting the consensus 
uh, uh, um, algorithm implementation uh, by using an external system that you have to maintain again, right? Like so, uh, as part of your all right. But uh, uh, if you are using Raft, then you will have to implement yourself as part of your own system, right? Like it wouldn't be like an external system. I think everyone uses Raft. Like you mentioned, maybe I think Redis probably uses some variation of Raft. Um, because there's no actual uh, uh, raft itself as a uh, system, right? Like, so uh, people take raft and then they, they use raft to implement consensus into the system. I guess. But actually, Kafka nodes are doing the consensus, right? Actually, otherwise, actually, it, uh, you will lose the data, right? So, yeah, yeah they, they use Zookeeper for that. For, no, and no, then... no, Zookeeper is for the leader election, the cluster management and all, right? Let's say um, I'm, I'm sending a write to a leader Kafka node, right? That leader has to replicate it to some nodes before telling me that your data is acknowledged, right? Otherwise I will lose that data. Let's say the leader gets down, right? Um, some sort of, some sort of uh, consensus is happening there, right? Oh yeah, that is, you mean like writing it to, uh like the broker was basically the leader for that uh, partition, right? So when when the broker receives that right, the broker would replicate the right to, let's say, uh, I think you would always have in Kafka, there's something called in-sync replicas, yeah, yeah, right? Like, yeah. so you would basically uh, say how many replicas have to be in sync, right? Like, so, which means you would have, to, and I think for that particular partition, uh, there will be some replica that is configured as in sync, right? Like there'll be, I mean, there can be multiple in sync replicas, but uh, the number that you configure should be the number of acknowledgements that this guy should get back from in sync replicas before he says that uh, uh, that write is successful, um, yeah. right? So um, it's not like a consensus algorithm, but I think it's more like the number of acknowledgement it receives uh, 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 from the, uh, it's more like a quorum kind of a thing. Yeah, they call us a F plus one system and, and quorum is two F plus one. I see, okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. Right. Hello, hello, hey. hello, hello. Hey, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a general question about uh, 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 about uh, uh, journaling. Uh, uh, I believe like most data systems that we are talking about, Kafka, Redis, like all of them would uh, do this kind of uh, snapshotting, right? Uh, like every, uh, like it's, uh, uh, so, 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 so recently I was asked a question. Uh, so, you know, let me put it here, okay. Uh, uh, what OS constructs uh, Redis uses to snapshot memory without really needing 2x memory while writing a snapshot. So Redis is an in-memory data store, right? Uh, so everything is uh, stored in memory, but at the same time, uh, like there can be node reboots or uh, node crashes that can happen. And if that happens, when it reboots, uh, you know, it has uh, this kind of a persistence, persistent file that's being written to, which, which, it, which it can reuse to get it to the previous state after reboot, okay? Uh, so, so the question is, uh, how is this uh, snapshot done without needing two x memory? Uh, let's say like uh, two, uh, let's say two keys were uh, re two puts happened, okay, and 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 to snapshot, I mean those two puts, uh, they need to be like persisted to a file uh, so that uh, you know in case of disaster we can recover the system, right? Uh, uh, so the question is like, how how is that snapshotting done efficiently without needing uh, the two X memory. Uh, does anybody have an opinion on that? Uh, I was thinking actually compaction. Maybe I'm not. I'm not answering the correct question. Let's say you are uh, writing this the 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 version one of the key and the version two of the key, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Basically, after snapshotting, you do a compaction. Compaction makes make sure that actually you throw away the version one and you keep only the version two. I see. Okay. Okay. Compaction is the way you reduce the size of your log, actually. Oh. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm. I'm not fully sure. I'm answering your question, actually. If anybody has any other ideas. I think I'm also throwing something in the dark. Basically, memory map files is one thing uh, that looks like that might fit. Uh, 
uh, this use case, right? So it's um, it's oh, basically. I, mm -hmm. I keep hearing memory map of files, but what is it, by the way? Uh, uh, I mean, how is it relevant to like uh, uh, like making systems efficient? Yeah, I think uh, if anybody has more context on this, I would. I would, yeah, I would probably, we need. I think we need to read a. Uh, but I mean, unless someone already has some context on it, I think it'd be nice to hear. Like, what scenarios do we? I have actually searched long time back. Like, when do we have to use memory map? Right? Like, so, uh, but I don't have any idea. I don't know. But I, I think, sorry, let me not. Uh, someone uh, can pin, pinch in here. One example could be sharing data between processes. Actually, I was going through one of the Alex Shu uh, kind I mean, of uh, white cup type yeah. first. So I didn't know you were there, Praveen. Good like... oh, take yeah. it from you. <laughs> After a long time. Yeah. Sorry, I, I forgot the context that you guys are talking about. Yes, yeah, so actually, I went through one of the, I think, LXU Twitter account. So he mentioned about something like zero copy thing, why Kafka is first. So maybe mm -hmm. we are talking in that context. So why yes. we don't do double copy? I think I just pasted a link in the chat. Oh, I see. I see. So what is a double copy thing? Okay. Uh, okay. 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 Usually it's, it's like... called zero copy. So. Kafka does a yeah. Kafka's uh, known for its that zero copy stuff, right? Like without copying mm -hmm. a specific piece of data to the user uh, 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 to the user space of two different processes, uh, it it directly transfers those records uh, from uh, the OS space into the network stack itself. Yeah, basically so, there is no copy in the application side. Yeah, exactly. User I space copy doesn't. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So it goes from system space to directly like system space, as you mentioned, in the network stuff. So maybe that would be the constant. I think Zelensky, <laughs> the question yeah. you were asked, I believe, yeah. so, but yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, perhaps that one. But uh, yeah, I'll read about uh, it. Could be uh, yeah. RS encoding. Uh, that most of these storage system actually use that to reduce the storage size instead of the exact one-to-one -one mapping. I don't know the internal details of that, but I know that warm storage and some of the FB system and could be S3 also use that. I see. Yeah, I also heard about that. Instead of replication, some system uses this ratio coding to recover uh, from the errors and all. Yeah. I see, I see. Sure. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Could, could you please repeat what is the coding? Uh, can you just... I... You can Google that RS encoding. Okay, sure, thank you. I think this discussion is getting pretty interesting, so no one wants to leave in spite of the time. <laughs> That's something. That's true. Anyhow, so um, maybe we can I stop have recording. Yeah. Okay, so just I have a question, like mind pixel that you were talking about the database. So if in your uh, document or whatever the diagram, if you can add that, maybe helpful. <laughs> Sure. 
So are we going to to upload this recording in the same place where others um, or? Uh,